Good morning, students. Today is Tuesday, 23 February, 2021. Now, the first thing I want to say is that if you have not yet taken the exam, you should not watch this video. This is the first video following the exam. Now, I know the exam is two days from now, but I don't want to put off my lectures until after the exam. I want to make sure I'm staying on track. So this is technically the first video that we that you will watch after you take the exam. So if you're if you have not yet taken the exam, stop the video, come back and watch it sometime after Thursday. Okay, the exam is on Thursday. So, assuming that you have now taken the exam and you've come back to watch this video, let's let's get started. We're starting chapter 4 today of Feldman. The title is Problems for Act Utilitarianism. And yes, we're still on the topic of act utilitarianism. There's simply a lot to be said, so Feldman spends a lot of time on it. The objections that we considered in Chapter 3 were raised by Mill himself, John Stuart Mill. Remember them? They are the Doctrine of Swine objection, the Too High for Humanity objection, and the Lack of Time objection. Mill addressed all of those in his little book entitled Utilitarianism, and Mill thinks that he responded adequately to those objections. In each case, you may recall, he grabbed the bull by the horn. Excuse me. And that means he denied the first premise of the critic's modus tollens argument. That's the premise that has the form if then. If act utilitarianism is true, then such and such. In all three cases, Mill replied to the critic that the critic did not understand his theory. Mill said that his theory does not have the implication that the critic says it does. Now, Feldman begins chapter four by saying that those objections taken up by Mill, quote, do not succeed in showing U7 to be false. So Feldman appears to agree with Mill that these objections fail. Does that mean that act utilitarianism is true? Remember, U sub 7 is our version of act utilitarianism. Does the failure of the critic to refute the theory show that the theory is true? The answer is no. There may be some other objection to U sub 7 that is fatal, that cannot be adequately replied to. So all we can say at this point is that U sub 7 is still standing. It has not been shown to be false. Of course, it hasn't been proved to be true either. So it's still a viable candidate for the correct normative ethical theory. So what we're going to do in this chapter is take up some additional objections or problems for U sub 7. Let me give you a quick sketch of what's in this chapter. According to this chapter, U sub 7 has a number of unacceptable or false implications. First, according to the critic, U sub 7 implies that there cannot be any supererogatory actions. And that's our topic for today. We'll get to it in just a moment. U sub 7, according to another critic, another criticism, says that there cannot be any trivial actions, like which cereal to eat. Many of us think that there are certain actions that are trivial. They're so insignificant that they're neither right nor wrong. And according to the critic, U sub 7 implies that there are no trivial actions and that even the choice of a cereal could be right or wrong. Third, and we're going to skip that objection, I should point out. Uh, we can't do everything in the book, so I chose to skip that objection. It seems to me to be not a very important objection, so we're going to skip that. But in terms of outlining what's in this chapter, I thought I'd mention it. Okay, according to the critic, U sub 7 implies that there's only one reason ever to keep a promise, and that is utility. According to U sub 7, the only reason there ever is to keep a promise that you have made is that keeping the promise would maximize overall 
utility or happiness. And the critic says that's just false, right? There are other reasons to keep a promise besides its utility. And we're going to talk about that um, in the next lecture. The fourth of five objections in this chapter is that according to U sub 7, the only reason to punish someone is that it would maximize overall utility or happiness. And the critic says that's just false. There are, there are other reasons to punish people besides the fact that it will maximize overall happiness. And finally, there are some problems related to justice or distribution. According to the critic, U sub 7 implies that how things like money are distributed is irrelevant. All that matters is that the distribution, whatever it may be, produces the greatest overall happiness or utility. And that seems wrong. The critic points out that it does matter how we distribute things like money. Right? We should try to distribute money in an equal way or as close to equal as we can. And yet utilitarianism says it doesn't matter how we distribute good things like money as long as whatever the distribution is, it maximizes overall happiness. So these are some common objections to U sub 7. Uh, Mill did not address them directly in his little book, although I'm sure some of these objections were, had been made long before Mill wrote his book. He didn't explicitly discuss them. So that's why Feldman treats them in a separate chapter. He calls it Problems for Act Utilitarianism. Many of these problems were brought up after Mill wrote his book and after Mill died. Okay, with that in mind, let's turn to the first section of Chapter 4. The title is Supererogatory Actions. That's probably a word you've never heard before, so we need to spend a little bit of time right off the bat making sure that you understand it. I'm going to give you some definitions. Let's begin with what Feldman himself says, because it's pretty good. On pages 48 and 49 of the book, Feldman writes the following, quote, to say that an action is supererogatory is to say two things, two main things about it, okay? Two things. First, the agent is not morally obligated to perform it. So the first thing we know about supererogatory actions is that they're not obligatory, right? They're not mandatory. So you don't have to perform them. Second, the action is morally praiseworthy. It would be a very good thing for it to be performed. So that's it. Those are the two characteristics of supererogatory actions. Now, remember our distinction between obligatory actions, forbidden actions, discretionary actions, and dilemmatic actions. Remember that? Uh, I had a handout for you where I explained all of that under the terminology, ethical terminology. Now, let's review what those mean. To say that an act is obligatory is to say two things, that it's right to perform it and wrong not to. Okay, once again, an action is obligatory if and only if it's right to perform it and wrong not to perform it. Okay, secondly, what does it mean for an act to be forbidden? Again, it means two things. It's wrong to perform it and right not to perform it. That's what it means to say that an act is forbidden. What does discretionary mean? An act is discretionary if and only if it's right to perform it, and also right not to perform it. So discretionary acts are where it's up to the agent what to do. You're not, you're not obligated to perform it, but you're not forbidden either. So either way, you act rightly. You act rightly if you perform that act, but you also act rightly if you choose not to perform it. Okay? The fourth type of act is what I call <clears throat> dilemmatic, meaning dilemma. And that's a, that's a situation where it's wrong to perform the act and also wrong not to. Now, given that you either perform an act or you don't, there's no other possibility, and you've got to do one or the other, 
you're in a tight spot, right? Because no matter what you do, no matter what you choose, you act wrongly. Now, it may or may not be that life throws up situations like that, where we're in a dilemma. We're damned if we do, damned if we don't. Uh, so we're not going to say a lot more about dilemmatic actions. I put them in my handout, and I'm discussing them now in order to complete the picture. Right? There are four different types of act, um, and there's a nice symmetry to it. You may have noticed that. So let's go back to the three main types of act, obligatory, discretionary, and forbidden. Where would you put supererogatory actions? Well, Feldman tells us they're not obligatory. Right? That's the first of two features. And we can assume, although Feldman doesn't say this, we can assume that a supererogatory act is not forbidden either. Right? In fact, why would we praise somebody for performing a supererogatory act if it was forbidden? Because that means it's wrong. We wouldn't praise someone for doing the wrong thing. So of the three types of act, obligatory, forbidden, and discretionary, where does supererogatory action go? It goes in the discretionary category. So we can say this. In fact, this might be a good exam question. True or false, all supererogatory acts are discretionary acts. True or false? That's true, right? If an act is supererogatory, we know that it's inside the discretionary category because we know it's not in the obligatory category and we know it's not in the forbidden category either. So it's true that all supererogatory acts are discretionary acts. The next question is, turn it around. Are all discretionary acts supererogatory? And here the answer is no. Only those discretionary acts that are praiseworthy are supererogatory. And that's the second part of Feldman's definition. So I'm going to state two propositions for you. It's true that all supererogatory acts are discretionary. It's false that all discretionary acts are supererogatory. Some of them are not. Which ones are not? those that are not praiseworthy. So focus for a few minutes or a couple of minutes, focus on the discretionary category, right? Think of it as a circle, right? Think of a circle, draw a circle and label it discretionary acts. Okay, that means any, any act that's discretionary, think of it as being inside the circle. Any act that's not discretionary, think of it as being outside the circle. You still with me? Now focus on the circle. Discretionary acts come in three varieties. Those that are praiseworthy, okay? Those that are blameworthy, and those that are morally indifferent. Another way to put it is discretionary acts are good, bad, or indifferent. Only the ones that are good or praiseworthy are the supererogatory ones. You see that? So we would not call an act supererogatory if it were blameworthy. We would not call an act supererogatory if it were morally indifferent. Only those that are praiseworthy or morally good are supererogatory. Just that one class. So we've divided the class of discretionary acts into three parts. And the supererogatory acts go in one of those three only the ones that are praiseworthy. Now let me give you a dictionary definition that may help you understand and remember the meaning of the word. This is from my Oxford American Language and, I'm sorry, Oxford American Dictionary and Language Guide, 1999. The word supererogation is defined as, quote, the performance of more than duty requires. More than duty requires. We might say that supererogatory acts go above and beyond the call of duty. You see that? That means it's a good thing if you do them, but you don't have to do them. And you can't be blamed if you don't do them. And it wouldn't be wrong if you don't do them. So once again, go back to Feldman's definition. A supererogatory act is 
not obligatory, but it is praiseworthy. It goes above and beyond the call of duty. You're not duty bound to perform them. But if you choose to anyway, we will praise you for it. We will say, good job. We might even consider you a hero. Uh, I posted on Canvas the other day a New York Times obituary for John Ripley, who was a Marine, uh, a United States Marine. And when you read that, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I get chills. This man single-handedly blunted or thwarted an attack during the, Vietne the Vietnamese War, and that those actions of his, that act of his, almost certainly saved a lot of innocent lives, innocent civilians. Uh, and when you read what he did, it's just amazing. I, I can't even imagine it. Uh, while under fire from the enemy across the river, he uh, crawled hand to hand on the I-beams under the bridge, carrying many, many pounds of explosives. And he did this many times. He crawled out using his hands. Imagine the upper body strength he had to do this. He crawled out um, hand over hand on the I-beams underneath the bridge, carrying on his back explosives. And each time he got to the part of the bridge he had in mind, he took the explosives off. Well, first I'm sure he climbed up into the I-beams. Then he took the explosives off and put them in place. He did that several times until he had all of the explosives lined up in a diagonal under the bridge. He then wired them all to each other. And according to the New York Times obituary, he had to bite down on the, cap, the capsule for each of these explosives. And according to the obituary, if he had bitten too high, it, it wouldn't have worked. If he bit too low, they would explode and kill him. Um, he then ran a wire all the way back, and they set, they detonated the bombs. It had the effect of shaking the bridge until it collapsed, and that kept the enemy from com coming over and killing or harming the civilians. So, not to make a long story, uh, not to make a story too long, but that's an act of heroism. I don't think anyone would suggest that someone in the military must risk his or her life in, in that way to save others. So we could say that Ripley was a hero. It's an act of heroism what he did. His action went above and beyond the call of military duty. Now, there may be someone who says that his actions were within the scope of his duty. Uh, there could be a debate about whether his actions were obligatory, meaning within the call of duty, or supererogatory, meaning above and beyond the call of duty. But it seems to me that um, the military would not require someone to do what he did. He took it upon himself to do that, at great risk to himself, obviously. Okay, now the word super the prefix super, as you probably know, means above or beyond. Think of the, the name Superman. Superman is not a regular man, a run-of-the-mill, everyday, ordinary man. He's a man who's above and beyond the ordinary. Uh, other uses of super are superscript. When you see a footnote in a book, um, the footnote is written above the line a little bit above the line. So super just means above or beyond something. So we're talking about actions that rise above or go beyond the call of duty or what's obligatory. Okay, let's now um, talk about some of some other examples of um, super erogatory action. Feldman on page 49, let me find it, Feldman gives three examples to illustrate what a supererogatory action is. On page 49, he says, any number of actions fit into this category. In wartime, a soldier may save the lives of his comrades by sacrificing his own, or at least risking his own death, his or her own death. Second example, a businessman may make large investments in order to prevent a panic knowing that his own fortune may be lost as a result. 
So the, the implication is that that act is praiseworthy because it, it saved a lot of, it prevented a panic, um, a run on the banks, for example, as happened in the Great Depression. And it came at a great cost to the businessman's own wealth. So we would say he wasn't obligated to do that, but he did anyway, and that's to be praised. Third, a person may undergo dangerous and painful surgery in order to provide a kidney to a sick child. So three examples of what we're now discussing, supererogatory actions. Other examples, some of them are quite mundane or everyday. Have you ever pitched, picked up a hitchhiker? If so, then you were engaged in super irrigation. I, I don't think anyone would say that you have an obligation to pick up someone who's hitchhiking. But if you choose to do so anyway, at some risk to yourself, that's a good thing, and we should be, you should be praised for it. Okay? Your duty did not require it, meaning it wasn't obligatory, but you did it anyway, and that's a good thing. Someone may have been stranded and need assistance. May, it may even have been in danger. Imagine someone caught in a blizzard and someone's car has stopped running and that person is hitchhiking to get out of the cold. If you stopped and gave the person a ride, uh, you may well have saved that person's life or kept the person from getting frostbitten. Uh, what, if, what if someone made a promise to you to repay, repay you some money? When the time comes for that person to repay you the money, uh, you have every right to demand the money because the person we're assuming made a solemn promise to you. But suppose you know that it would be a hardship for that person to pay you the money at that time. You might release the person from the obligation. You may say, look, you're supposed to pay me the money and I have every right to demand it. But I understand that times are hard for you. Things will be better in a week or two. So I'll tell you what, pay me the money next week or two weeks from now when you get your paycheck. Okay, that's called a release of an obligation or a release of a promise in this case. And if you do such a thing, you are engaged in a super erogatory act. Right? Duty does not require that you release the person or give the person an extension of time. So if you do, we would say it's praiseworthy. Okay, it satisfies the two requirements, doesn't it? Um, what about other automobile related actions? Uh, many times in my life, be mainly because I drove junky cars when I was a student, um, my car might not start at the end of a school day and I had to drive a long way to get home. Some good Samaritan helped me by jumping my car, giving me a jump start. And I, of course, was grateful to the person who did so. Um, that's an act of super irrigation. Uh, we can assume that the person had no duty to help me. Uh, it may have been inconvenient. Maybe um, the person could have been in danger. Not that I posed a threat, but the person who helped me didn't know that. So that would be another act of super irrigation. Now, many times when I've been riding my bike out in the countryside, I've had bike problems, maybe a flat tire that I was unable to patch. Um, I can think of examples where people, even though I wasn't hitchhiking, I was simply walking my bike, uh, someone stopped and said, do you need help? And on more than one occasion, I said, yes, I do. Thank you so much for stopping to help me. Um, so when somebody does that, that's a that's a, an act of super irrigation. In fact, I mentioned a moment ago, Good Samaritanism. There's a biblical parable some of you may be familiar with where someone um, rendered assistance to someone who had been robbed and left on the side of a road. And I think we would call that an act of super irrigation, especially since the person didn't just um, heal the person's wounds or, or fix the wounds, the person took the person to an inn and um, promised to pay the innkeeper for whatever it cost to house the person. 
So that goes way, I think we can agree, that goes way above and beyond the call of duty. So the Good Samaritan in that biblical parable was engaged in an act of super irrigation. Okay, so those are some examples. Well, maybe one more. I'd like to tell the story about parenting. In fact, I think there are three types of parenting. Some parenting is super erogatory, meaning it, it goes above and beyond the call of duty. Some parenting is what I call erogatory, which means it's within the call of duty, but not beyond it. And some parenting is sub-erogatory, which means it falls below what duty requires. Now, I was fortunate, I don't know about you, but I was very fortunate to have parents who engaged in super-erogatory parenting. My parents didn't just do their duty with regard to my brothers and me, they didn't just feed us adequately, clothe us, provide us with shelter, see to it that we got an education. They went above and beyond that. They took us on wonderful vacations out west or into the New England states. My mother was a good cook, and she cooked us not just adequate meals, but terrific meals, including lots of pastries and other sweets. My mother cooked us cookies and pies and cakes and cinnamon rolls, all kinds of wonderful uh, goodies, as I would call them. Uh, my mother and my stepfather saw to it that we had um, snowmobiles so that we could uh, have fun in the snow every winter in Michigan, uh, and many other things. So I was lucky that my parents went above and beyond their parental duty. I'm well aware, though, that some parents don't do that. I've talked to people whose parents did their duty, but nothing more than that. So we can call them erogatory parents. And sadly, very sadly, some people have had parents or have parents who do less than their duty. They either neglect their children by not providing for their needs. And in some cases, they go beyond neglect and abuse their children. So um, I hope you, like me, had super erogatory parents. Okay, let's now turn to the objection. This is supposed to be an objection to act utilitarianism. Now that you have a better understanding of what a super erogatory action is, what is the problem with regard to U sub 7? Well, the problem is this. U sub 7 appears to say that, or imply that there are no super erogatory actions. There aren't any. And I want you to understand why, the, why that would be. Now remember, let's go back and apply U sub 7 using Bentham's philosophic calculus. According to U sub 7, each of us must, at any given moment, r determine which actions are available to us, rank them by the amount of net utility they would produce, rank them from highest to lowest, and then perform whichever act is at the top of the ranking. Right? U sub 7 requires that we perform the act that produces at least as much net utility as any other act. And by the way, I want to come back to something I said earlier. I, um, U sub 7 does acknowledge that there are discretionary acts, but only in cases of a tie. Remember the twins, the twin case, where the, the father had a, a single piece of unbreakable candy, and since he couldn't break it, he had to give it to one twin or the other. It would be wrong of him not to give it to either one of the twins because then he would be missing out on some happiness. So he's going to have to pick one of the twins to give the candy to. Which one should he give it to? Well, according to U sub 7, it doesn't matter. As long as he gives it to one of the twins and not none of the twins, neither of the twins. So if there's a tie then each of the actions that is tied is discretionary, okay? 
if the father gave the candy to the first twin, that would be the right thing to do. But if the father gave the, act, the candy to the second twin, that would also be the right thing to do. So either of those two acts is discretionary. What is obligatory is for the father to give the candy to at least one of the two twins. If there is something obligatory, and that is either give it to the first twin or give it to the second twin. That disjunctive act, either or, that disjunctive act is obligatory. Each act individually is discretionary. Why? Because they're tied at the top of the ranking. So let me go back to my point. You, oh, and by the way, let's ignore ties for the rest of the discussion today. Okay, I've, I've just told you what happens in a tie. Technically, if there's a tie, each of the actions that is tied uh, is discretionary. Okay, now back to the main point. Act utilitarianism, which is U sub 7, implies that there are no discretionary acts other than the ones where they're tied. Okay, let's set that aside now. Why? Why does U sub 7 imply that there are no discretionary acts? Well, think about it. Once you rank the actions, and again, assuming there's no tie at the top, whichever act is at the top is obligatory. All the other acts that are below it are forbidden. So according to U sub 7, every act is either obligatory or forbidden. If it's at the top of the ranking, it's obligatory. If it's not at the top of the ranking, it's forbidden. So the problem is U sub 7 implies that there are no discretionary acts. Again, when we're assuming there are no ties. But remember that supererogatory actions are a subset of discretionary acts. Remember, I told, about, told you about the circle. Think of discretionary acts as a circle. We divided it up into three categories. Those that are praiseworthy, those that are blameworthy, and those that are morally indifferent. So supererogatory acts are a subset, a proper subset, of discretionary acts. So if U sub 7 implies that there are no discretionary acts, then it also implies that there are no supererogatory acts. If you want to see how this works, look at Feldman's mailman case. Now, Feldman treats the mail carrier as a man, so I will do so as well. He uses masculine pronouns. But look at page 48 of the book, and let's get the facts of this hypothetical case out on the table so we can discuss it, make sense of it. Feldman writes, suppose that in the course of his daily rounds, a mailman comes upon a burning house. Remember, he's a mailman. That's his job description. He's not a fireman or a police officer. He's a mail carrier. The firemen on the scene believe that there is a baby in one of the upstairs rooms, but they cannot get close enough to save it. The flames are simply too intense. The mailman, and here you should gasp in horror, the mailman puts down his mailbag, dashes into the burning house, and saves the baby from a terrible fate. So that's the basic situation involving the mailman, the mail carrier. Feldman now comments on it. He says, we observers, we may want to describe this action as being beyond the call of duty, or heroic, like John Ripley, the Marine. We say that such action is beyond the call of duty, apparently because we feel that the mailman does not have any duty or moral obligation to behave in this way. The action is so difficult and so dangerous that we would not feel that he had shirked his duty if he had refrained from going in after the baby. Now, compare our reaction to what the mail carrier did to what our action might have been if when we got there a firefighter ran in to save the baby. 
we, whether the firefighter's attempt is successful or not, it's the act of making the attempt that, that poses the risk to the firefighter, right? We don't always know how things are gonna work out when we commence our action. So what we're praising is the effort, the attempt to save the baby. Now, if a, male, if a firefighter ran in like the mailman did, we might be inclined to say that that's part of the job of a firefighter. Right? We, we might say that that's what firefighters are obligated to do. That's why they're paid, right? That's part of their job description. So if a firefighter ran into the burning building, we might describe it as obligatory. If a police officer ran in, we might even describe it as obligatory for the same general reason. Police officers are paid to risk their lives for the rest of us or for the sake of the rest of us. Uh, and that may include running into a burning building on occasion. But when the mail carrier runs in, that's different. I mean, I don't think anybody would say that it's part of the job description of a mail carrier to make rescue attempts at great risk to one's life. So the reason Feldman made it a mail carrier is because we can all agree that that's not within the scope of the mail carrier's duty. Okay, so this case is supposed to prime your intuitions. I, I assume that you, like me, when you read that said, oh my goodness, um, nobody would blame that mail carrier for not rushing into the burning building, especially when the firefighters are standing there doing nothing, or at least they're not making a rescue effort. They're probably doing something. They're probably trying to put the fire out, but they're not running in to make a rescue attempt. So we're all supposed to think the, fire, the mail carrier's action is not obligatory, and it's certainly praiseworthy because he's trying to save a baby's life, an innocent baby. So this looks like a classic example of a super erogatory act. Here's the problem. U sub seven says it's not obligatory. I'm sorry, it's not supererogatory. It's not supererogatory. It's either obligatory if it maximizes net utility or it's forbidden if it doesn't maximize net utility. So let's see how, let's see how uh, an act utilitarian would arrive at this conclusion. Look at page 49 of the book near the bottom. Uh, Feldman says, for the purpose of this example, let us assume that the utilities of the mailman's alternatives are roughly as follows. And he chose four different actions that the mail carrier could perform, right? Just to simplify it. There are probably more than four, but these are the main ones. Act number one, enter house and save baby. Now, really, that should say what? enter house and try to save baby, okay? Because you don't know when you enter the house whether you'll be successful. But at, at any rate, we might assign a, a high positive utility to that act of trying to save the baby, plus 500. Second possibility, help fight fire, save baby later, okay? so. Make yourself useful. Maybe you can hold the hose, which those hoses are heavy and powerful. Maybe the, fire, the mail carrier can assist the firefighters to try to put the fire out. And if the fire is put out quickly enough, the baby's life may be spared. And then the baby can be saved from the, uh, the heat and the smoke. So Feldman assigns plus 25 to that act because there's a small chance that that will succeed in saving the baby's life. Third, throw rope ladder, hope for miracle. Feldman says minus 10. That's not likely at all to work and it will uh, take you away from doing something more useful like holding the hose or fetching something for the firefighters. And finally, go back to the post office. That would be minus 10, right? Just leave the scene, go back and do your job as a mail carrier finish up your work and go home for the day. So that would, that would have probably no positive value. By the way, Feldman shows his wit here, even though the example is 
is frightening. Feldman says, um, he says, he, the mail carrier can get a rope ladder, throw it up to the window of the room containing the baby, and hope the baby will be fi able to figure out how to use it. Now that's ridiculous, isn't it? No baby is going to figure out how to use a rope ladder. So Feldman is being a little bit silly. The point he's making, however, is a serious point. Feldman is saying that if this is how the ranking came out, and it's plausible that it would, what would an act utilitarian say? Remember, U sub 7 says an act is right if and only if no other act that the agent could perform has would have higher net utility than it has. And so that means you are to perform whichever act is at the top of the rankings. It's obligatory. And which act is that? It's enter house and try to save baby. So what most, most people would consider to be super erogatory turns out to be obligatory according to U sub 7. And that just seems wrong. It seems as though act utilitarianism is requiring too much. It's too demanding. Act utilitarianism turns super erogatory acts, which are discretionary, into obligatory acts. It, it requires far too much of us. In fact, the critics say that act utilitarianism requires us to be heroes on a daily basis, right? We are to risk our lives whenever doing so would maximize overall utility. Uh, it, it might even require that we be saints. I haven't mentioned that yet today. We talked about heroes like Ripley, like Colonel Ripley. But what, what is a saint? A saint might be thought of as a constant hero. Heroism is episodic, right? Uh, some, some of us rise to the occasion and act heroically. But how many people are capable of heroism on an ongoing, almost daily basis? If there were someone like that, we would give a, a special name to that person. And the name that we commonly use is saint. We say, what a saintly person that is. In fact, various religions have, um, have saints, right? People are put up for sainthood, and some of them um, succeed in becoming saints. Uh, think of Saint Mother Teresa in the Roman Catholic Church. She has been sainted by her church, not just for a single act of heroism at, at some point in her life, or even for an occasional act of heroism every few years. Mother Teresa was a constant hero. Day in and day out, she risked her life to minister to the needs of people with diseases like leprosy at great risk to herself. On a regular, routine, daily basis, she exposed herself to harm for the sake of others. So. Heroes and saints are not the same. I hope you can see that. They're related. We can think of a saint as someone who's heroic on a regular basis, a routine, maybe even a daily basis. So let me come back to the critic. The critic says that what's wrong with U sub 7 is that it requires ordinary people like you and me to be heroes and maybe even saints. And that's just demanding too much, the critic says. Right? The, the criticism is that um, it's unacceptable to expect that much of people. So here on page 50 is what Feldman calls the super arrogation objection. And we'll ask what can the utilitarian say in response to it. I probably don't have to tell you that the form of this objection is... Can you guess? Modus tollens. Once again, the form of a modus tollens argument is premise one, if P then Q. Premise two, not Q. Conclusion three, not P. So that form should be imprinted in your brain by now. We're going to keep seeing it over and over and over throughout the book. And you also know what it's called when the proponent of the theory rejects the first premise of a modus tollens argument. That's called grabbing the bull by the horn. 
And you know what it's called when the theorist rejects the second premise of a modus tollens argument. That's called biting the bullet. Sometimes the theorist will grab the bull by the horn. We saw Mill do that three times. Sometimes the, the theorist will bite the bullet. We saw Bentham do that with regard to the too high for humanity objection. Bentham, unlike Mill, bit the bullet. Bentham said that at utilitarianism, or U sub 7, really does say that only the quantity of pleasure matters. Only the quantity matters. That was Bentham's view. And in saying that, he rejected the second premise of the too high for humanity argument. And that means he bit the bullet. Mill, in that same case, grabbed the bull by the horn. So there you have a divergence between two great utilitarians. Right? They're both utilitarians. They have the same theory. But in response to this particular objection, they took a different path. Right? They had a different strategy. Okay, here is the objection. Premise number one. This is the if-then premise. If U7 is true, then the mailman in the example is morally obligated to save the baby. Now, Feldman left out the word then. You may notice I read it as though it were there. Right? He, he, he probably should always put the word then in there, but it's usually understood even if it's not there. Okay, once again, if U7 is true, then the mailman in the example is morally obligated to save the baby. Right? That seems to be true, doesn't it? It looks like U sub 7 obligates the mailman to make the rescue effort because it came out at the top of the ranking. The second premise goes like this. It's, since saving the baby is supererogatory, the mailman is not morally obligated to save the baby or to try to save the baby. Okay, that's the second premise. The critic says, oh, come on now. Seriously? The mail, the mail carrier in this case isn't obligated to save the baby. If he makes an attempt, we should praise it. Good job. Good for you. Nice try. Uh, noble, heroic thing for you to do. Whether you save the baby or not, it was heroic, but not obligatory, okay? Not morally obligatory. Now, what follows from these premises? What we have is if P, then Q, and not Q. It follows that not P, which is U7, is not true. So this is an objection to U sub 7. It has the same form as the objections that Mill raised, right? The doctrine of swine and so on. So what do you think is the best strategy for an act utilitarian? Remember, the act utilitarian will not accept the conclusion. Why? Because it says U7 is not true. All right? So the last thing the utilitarian is going to do is going to accept, is accept the conclusion. So that means the act utilitarian must reject the conclusion. But it's a valid argument. So if the conclusion of a valid argument is false or unacceptable, then the theorist has to reject either the first premise or the second premise. You can't do both. You don't need to do both. But you've got to do at least one of those two things. Grab the bull by the horn or bite the bullet. Now, I think you could go either way on this. So here's what Feldman says about the strategy of grasping the bull by the horn. According to premise one, U sub seven implies that the act enter, house, and save baby is obligatory. But this is true, Feldman says, only for agents who are able to perform that act. And there may be very few such people. Could you do it? Think about it. Whether you're a mail carrier or just a bystander, would you be able to run into a burning building, a, a, a building that is burning so hot that even the firefighters aren't going in? Would you psychologically be able to make a rescue effort? If the answer, I, I, I wouldn't, okay? I'll be honest with you. I don't think I would. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. 
What does that mean? If you're unable to do something, it cannot be the case that you're obligated to do it. There's a name for that principle. It's called ought implies can. I think I may have mentioned it earlier in the course. I can't remember how it came up, but it, even if I didn't, let me explain it briefly. Ought implies can. What that means is that in order for somebody to have an obligation to do something, it must be possible for that person to do it. So if I'm physically unable to do something, suppose I'm in a straitjacket and uh, someone's choking and someone later criticizes me and says, Keith, you should have made a rescue effort. My response would be, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm in a, I was in a straitjacket. How can I make a rescue effort when I'm bound up? I can't even move my arms. That would be a good excuse, wouldn't it? I, I can't have an obligation to do something unless I can do it. Saying somebody ought to do something implies that he or she can do it. And if it's, as a matter of fact, you can't do it, then you, it's not the case that you ought to do it. You have no obligation to do it. So the first point Feldman makes is that the first premise is true only with regard to that special person who can make the rescue effort. And since only an occasional few people can do that, then the ought implies can principle rules out the rest of us being obligated. Now, here's how Feldman puts it on page 50. If an agent is genuinely unable to perform the act, then it is not one of his alternatives. Unquote. So the first reply to this objection is to grab the bull by the horn, to deny the first premise. The problem with that is that while most people may be unable to make a rescue effort, some may. And those who are able to make a rescue effort do have an obligation to do so. And that shows that, that the first premise of this argument is false. It's, it's false. It may be true for most people, but it's false for some people, right? Because some people, for some people, it's false that if U7 is true, then the mailman is morally obligated to save the baby. The mailman may be one of those rare people who is able to make a rescue effort. Okay, the, I think the second uh, response to this argument is more effective. It's biting the bullet. The act utilitarian can simply say that, uh, well, let's look at the second premise. It says, since saving the baby is supererogatory, the mailman is not morally obligated to save the baby. What are you saying if you reject that? You're saying that the mailman is morally obligated to save the baby. That's biting the bullet, isn't it? And I think most act utilitarians would bite the bullet here and say, sorry, but it's not supererogatory. The mailman uh, can do a great amount of good. There's no other act the mailman can perform that would produce as much overall happiness, so he's obligated to do it. The act utilitarian bites the bullet. What does that mean? It means it's painful to say such a thing, but in order to save the theory, the utilitarian will say it anyway and believe it anyway. So there are two responses to this argument. You can grab the bull by the horn. The problem with that is that it's not going to work for everybody. Right? There are people who are able to perform the act, and for those who are able, they are actually obligated. Okay, so this premise is true for most people, but false for some. The fallback position for the act utilitarian is to de deny the second premise, uh, which is biting the bullet, and to simply say, I'm sorry, but I think that the mailman was indeed obligated, and that means it's right for him to do it and wrong if he doesn't. And because it's wrong, if he doesn't, he should be blamed for it, criticized for it, held responsible for it. Okay? He is obligated to make a rescue effort. So I'll leave it to you to decide whether this is a, an effective reply, 
by the act utilitarian. Many critics think that the theory is too demanding. It requires us to be heroes or even saints, and that seems to take morality too far. Uh, morality can't require that much, the critic says. Right? This is often called the demandingness objection to act utilitarianism. Okay? It turns what should be a supererogatory act into an obligatory act and requires us, therefore, to be heroes and saints. Okay, that's enough for today. We're almost, um, we're closing in on one hour. Um, I'm going to get this posted. If you, um, I assume if you've gone this far in my video, you took to heart what I said at the outset, and, um, and you watched it only after the exam was over. So I assume that as you're listening to me right now, you've already taken the exam on Thursday, and you're getting started on the new material which will be covered on the second exam. Okay, have a great day. Uh, whichever day you watch this, have a great rest of the day, and I'll see you on the screen one more time this week. Okay, bye-bye.